No ancient city has so captured the modern imagination as Rome. From its mythical founding to its emergence as the dominant power on the earth, first as a monarchy, then an empire, and finally a republic, only to crumble from within, the world's fascination with ancient Rome seems to have no bounds. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the story of ancient Rome centers around its mythical founding by the twin brothers from which the city's name derives, Remus and Romulus. Welcome to History Simplified, and for today, we'll be looking at Remus and Romulus. Before we begin, make sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Without further ado, let's begin. Roman historians date the city's founding to the year 753 BCE. The first written account of the Remus and Romulus account of its founding dates to the 3rd century BCE. Three most prominent ancient accounts of the myth are found in the works by Livy, Plutarch, and Dionysus. Though the vast majority of modern historians agree that Remus and Romulus were mythological figures, there are some who consider them to be real historical figures. According to the legend, Remus and Romulus were the twin sons of a woman by the name of Rhea Silvia, who lived in the ancient Latin city of Alba Longa, situated about 12 miles from the future site of Rome. Rhea was the daughter of Numitor, who had previously been deposed as king of Alba Longa. Amelius, the new ruler of the city who happened to be the brother of Numitor, was worried that Rhea would produce male offspring who would stake their hereditary claim on the kingship. As a result, she was forced to take a vow of chastity as a Vestal Virgin. As a Vestal Virgin, Rhea was to spend her life as a priestess in the service of Vesta, the goddess of hearth and home. Despite remaining true to her vow of chastity, however, she became pregnant through some form of divine conception. The various accounts differ somewhat as to the details. Several accounts state that Rhea was visiting the sacred grove of the god Mars when she was impregnated by him. Rhea gave birth to twin boys. When he received the news that his niece had given birth, Amelius ordered that the boys be killed to prevent them from having any claim to his throne. In order to avoid retribution from the gods, Amelius stipulated that the boys be killed by drowning. To distance himself from the act, he ordered one of his servants to carry out the infanticide. The servant was instructed to throw the twin boys into the Tiber River. Amelius' servant took possession of the twins and carried them to the edge of the river, but was unable to carry out the murderous task he had been assigned. His compassion for the babies led him to put them in a basket, allowing them to drift downstream. This portion of the story is remarkably similar to the Bible account of Moses as a baby when he was sent down the Nile River in a basket after Pharaoh ordered the death of all Jewish male babies. According to the legend, the river god Tiberinus calmed the waters of the Tiber in order to protect the lives of the twins. Through his divine guidance, the basket containing the boys was directed ashore at the base of one of the future seven hills of Rome, the Palatine. The basket soon came to the attention of a she-wolf, but rather than killing the boys, the wolf carried them to its cave, which has been identified as being located between the Temple of Magna Mater and Sant'Anastasia al Palantino. The wolf suckled the twins and nourished them as its own offspring. The written accounts of this famous episode named the she-wolf as Lupa. After some time, the boys were discovered by a shepherd who took possession of them. This man, Faustulus, raised the boys as his son, along with his wife, Acca Laurentia. As they grew, the twins, who their adopted parents had named Remus and Romulus, became powerful young men. They were popular members of their village community, and in their late teens had developed quite an entourage. By the time the twins reached their early 20s, the decades-long dispute between the deposed Numitor and his brother the King Amulius had developed to the extent that both had their faction of fervent supporters. Battle ensued, and the twins got themselves involved on the side of Numitor. Remus was taken captive by the soldiers of the king and transported to Alba Longa. Romulus immediately set out to free his brother. It was around this time that the twins learned of their true identity. According to the legend, both Numitor and Amulius were the first to suspect that the strapping young twins were the boys who were meant to have drowned on the Tiber two decades earlier. When the truth of his identity became clear to Romulus, he joined forces with his grandfather to help him reclaim the throne that was rightfully his. Romulus spearheaded the attack which resulted in the release of his brother. The various accounts agree that the twins then both confronted their granduncle, King Amulius, who had ordered their death all those years before. They killed the king and restored their grandfather Numitor to the throne. The twins had been given the option of ruling over all belong of themselves, but they refused, stating that they would rather establish a brand new city elsewhere, but then they failed to come to an agreement as to where this city should be situated. Romulus was intent on building the city on the Palatine Hill, close to the cave where they had been suckled by Luca the she-wolf. His brother Remus, however, had settled on a hill that was the southernmost of the seven hills that Rome would encompass. Unable to come to an agreement, they decided to leave the decision to the gods. This would be done through a contest known as augury, the ancient practice of interpreting signs from the gods through the actions of birds. 
Remus claimed to have seen six birds that were performing God-directed movements. His brother then countered by claiming to have seen 12 such birds. Remus failed to accept this, and the enmity between the twins grew worse. A short time later, Remus was killed. Some accounts state that Romulus was the murderer, with others claiming that the deed was carried out by one of his supporters. Another account tells us that, having won the contest of augury, Romulus declared the site of the new city to be the Palatine. He had then had a huge ditch dug and proclaimed that any person who crossed it without his expressed permission would be put to death. According to this account, Remus defied his brother and crossed the ditch, at which Romulus had him executed. Romulus went on to found the city at Palatine, the site where he and his brother had been rescued by the She-Wolf. He named it Roma in honor of himself, and he naturally became the city's first king. According to the legend, there were no women in Rome when it was established. In order to correct the situation, Romulus invited a neighboring tribe, the Sabines, to a feast. The visiting men and women were ushered into a banquet hall. The doors were then barred from the outside. The male Sabinians were then plied with alcohol and slaughtered, and their women were taken captive. As a result of these outrageous actions, Titus Tatius, king of the Sabines, declared war on Rome. Eventually, a peace accord was entered into by which Romulus and Titus Tatius shared rulership of Rome. This co-rule lasted for five years until the death of the Sabinian king. The death of Romulus is recorded by 1st century CE Roman historian Titus Livy in his monumental work Ab Urbe Condita, or From the Founding of the City. In this account, 33 years after the death of Titus Tatius, Romulus was inspecting his army in the Campus Martius, or Field of Mars, a large public square in the heart of Rome. Then, without warning, a terrible rain and dust storm occurred. Simultaneously, the sun went dark in a solar eclipse. People ran for cover. When the storm had subsided and the sunlight had been restored, Romulus was nowhere to be found. According to Livy's account, he was raised to heaven in a whirlpool of dust to forever reside with his father, the god Mars. Livy, however, astute historian that he was, also includes the possibility that Romulus was killed by the Philistines, who had become Rome's chief adversary, using the cover of a dust storm to hide their dirty work. He also relates that there was suspicion among the people of Rome that their beloved king had been assassinated by duplicitous nobles. The day after the king's disappearance, Julius Proculus, a supposed close friend of the king, claimed to have received a vision while sleeping in which Romulus had appeared to him and told him that he had been taken by the gods. When Julius asked why he would leave them when so many people loved and adored him, Romulus said to have replied that he had been sent to the earth to create a city that would rise to be the most magnificent in the entire world. Now that the task was completed, he had returned to heaven to watch over the inhabitants of the city as the god Quirinus. Just as Romulus had foretold, Rome was indeed to rise to a position of worldwide greatness. Just as spectacularly, however, it would fall from grace, not through outside conquest, but as a result of the unbridled ambitions of the rulers who would follow in its founder's footsteps.